Hey everybody, I am very excited to announce the next summer edition of the Knowledge Graph Technology Showcase. Now, if you missed the first showcase, this was done in the winter months. I will link the playlist down below if you want to go and check that out. And in that showcase, we focused on some of the top knowledge graph databases out there on the market. I did an honest review and there are summary slides at the end of each of those videos. So make sure you go and check that out this time around to have a little bit more fun. And so what we're going to do is we're going to focus on data visualization and not just one aspect of data visualization, but we're going to be looking from how do you model the data and gather the data and do things with the data, getting it into a database and also making visualizations that you can find information from, your end users can find valuable. And I find these data visualizations incredible incredibly useful when talking to senior stakeholders. All right, and just like last time, these are not paid promotionals in any way. I reached out to these vendors and they were kind enough to work with me on these videos. These are all going to be my honest reviews of these tools and services. And there's going to be a summary slide at the end of each video, just like last time. So the technology that we're going to be reviewing today is there we go. All right. So without further ado, let's go get started. So I am here with Christoph and he is going to be showing us a tool that I think has really started to pick up steam on social media. I've heard a lot about it and I really love it because it is visual on top of graph. And so we are going to get a little sneak peek of what that looks like. So go ahead, Christoph, take it away. So welcome to Yum. Yum is a graph powered insights engine. So it means nothing and a lot of things at the same time. <laughs> so based on Neo4j as underlying database, and we have a full application layer on top of this graph database, breaking down projects into knowledge graphs. Right, so here, my knowledge graph of today is the Reuters newsfeed graph, which actually can show you most of the functionalities that, that we have. So we are very, very schema based. So uh we love schemas and we think this is the only way to to make predictable uh like applications on top of graphs so everything mm -hmm. in you is based on the schema um and on top of the schema we also have what we call perspective so perspectives are um kind of views on the schema Right, so they, they can actually break down. So here is the main perspective and it is synchronized with the schema. So it means it looks exactly like the schema. But if I would take, for example, co-occurrence. So here, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have only a portion of the graph. So this is really meant to for two things, right? So being able to represent information differently. So based on the same data, there are other features for that that, we, that I will explain later, but uh, perspective is part of it. So being able really to have these 360 degrees views of of your data and being able to um to make pies of those views depending so on the you, type of use yeah would you consider perspectives a sort of filter or facet approach mm -hmm. to looking at your your full graph in a way that will yeah, yeah. allow you to get those insights faster yes okay. exactly so it can be seen as a facet but also it's really meant towards different types of users. So on the perspective, you mm -hmm. can also describe the search, like the relevance of, of the classes and relationships for search, right? So you can see for a particular type of users, generally when they search in, in the graph, they're more interested into organizations, for example. So, right, and mm -hmm. when they search, and another type of user is more interested into investors because they, like mm. they're looking at different insights actually so we can actually ease their experience into mm. um into the perspective i like uh, this this is pretty cool that you can really tailor not just the view which i think a lot of other graph visualization tools allow you to do but you can also it looks like basically make a completely calibrated search but then the big aspect also of perspective that we have in other use cases, especially in law enforcement use cases, for example, mm. is the ability to decide who can see what's really mm. well, security based, yeah. right? So we can actually uh, grant um, access to a perspective to, to a user. 
And so the user with that role will be able right. to use that perspective, right? And this applies also when you search, right? So we make sure that when you search, we don't search on attributes or classes that you're not allowed to see. Okay, how to actually move data uh, from one place to, to the graph to be able to actually match our needs, right? So we have what we call orchestra. So I will not spend too much time on orchestra. It's really uh, human-friendly ETL. The orchestra piece seems like it's how you then populate the schema that you've already created. Is that accurate? The populate the data into, into yeah, the graph. Yes. Data. Right. Yes. And then so, all yeah. of this is still sitting on neo 4 j Is that accurate? Yeah. So, um, so the schema itself is not stored in Neo4j. Again, you don't need a database at all to have a schema. Sure. So oh. everything that is application data, I would mm -hmm. say that it's not the graph data is stored in our application database, which is in PostgreSQL. Um, mm -hmm. But then what I will do here is really move data from CSV files, for example, to Neo4j. I have here Crunchbase acquisition. So this is really just a CSV file. So this is the open source mm -hmm. data set from Crunchbase. And you will see mm -hmm. that at the end of the day, this is um, simply writing line by line to Neo4j. So if I would start this, this workflow, Right, so you will see that, um, so it starts, it reads the CSV, then for each line of the CSV, I will write to an FOG. Oh, so that's cool. So so yeah. orchestra, orchestra, yeah, orchestra is not only just populating in the data, you know, there's other um, graph yes. database workbenches that just populate data and that's it. This is actually doing some of the ETL, which is pretty cool. Yes, I don't yes, yes. know if this I've is... actually seen that before. Yeah, so this is uh, this is really uh, ETL data enrichment, uh, data integration and mm -hmm. enrichment. So and it is human friendly. So when I say what I say by human friendly, is that we actually make things easy for the for the end user. So you have access to each row of the CSV, actually. Mm -hmm. So you can help you to inspect the data while it is being ingested. Nice. Um, now let's see another workflow, which will be much more interesting. Is I will ingest uh, RSS feeds. So all those are uh, RSS feeds from TechCrunch, from um, CrunchGear, uh, mainly TechCrunch, right? So, but you see the the workflow is much more uh, bigger. Mm -hmm. So let's let me start so I can explain. We can write to so actually if I would stop it. So you can see, so I can persistence, we can write to RabbitMQ, to, oh, wow. to cool. other CSV files, okay. to, to S3, to wow, Elasticsearch, to Kafka, um, send emails as well. And for, for in terms of data input, we can take input from RSS feed like you see, Azure Blob Store, Webhook, so you can post yourself, yeah. post requests, RabbitMQ, Kafka files, S3, you know, for J itself, and JDBC, so everything SQL mm -hmm, that can mm -hmm. speak JDBC. So now I want to speak about this workflow, actually. So if I would look at the output of RSS feed, well, you can see that it has some text, but it is in HTML, like mm -hmm. with a lot of HTML mm -hmm. uh, forms. So we actually can also have some small transform components so we can write some python here right mm. so to be able to process the message and produce a new message to the new component actually mm -hmm. so here we can clean the text right for example remove all the html tags so this means that when it arrives here we have a new item in the message right so this is why we call this a uh, like really a data integration and enrichment so we can mm -hmm. really enrich the text so here i have text full so it is the same text as here, but clean from the Python component mm -hmm. before, right? Here. Oh, cool. So you can put your own machine learning yes. pieces so, in. Oh, that's so, neat. Yeah. So we can extract name entities and extract keywords and key phrases, right? And so, then write. So one, can I ask a question on that? So of course. let's say I already have something maybe in um, AWS uh, Textract or something. Can I connect that into this pipeline? Um, or or do you not integrate with the other AWS tool sets? So we integrate with everything that, that can be called as an HTTP API, right? Okay, so, cool. Oh, great. So you're just all API-based. So, right. So, oh, that's so, but, great. So it sounds yeah, like it's, yeah. it's pretty flexible depending on whether you're doing pre batch or if you're doing, you know, something that yes. is 
um, at runtime. That's really nice that it's it's flexible enough. And so Hume is usually sitting on top of right now. You are used by a lot of people from Neo 4J, correct? But yes. you know what other things? What what what's the second most popular thing that people put Hume on top of? Mm, well, Neo 4J, I would say. So this is really the <laughs> yeah. One. So this is um, this is a very good question because. Uh, so as of today, like the when it comes down to visualization, um, like the only database we support is uh, the for J four visualization, right? Exactly. So, but like we saw also like companies that have a kind of data science team as well, where mm -hmm. they need to prepare the data before it is incoming to Neo4j. They can use a lot of orchestra here, especially mm -hmm. when because I mean creating workflow pipelines with like handling a lot of failures, uh, connections yeah. to a lot of different systems, it requires a lot of engineering at the end of the day, right? Yeah, I mean, so, I guess you could do and, the pre-processing yes. stuff, right? And could you write it to like, let's say you're just doing a data dump and you're throwing it into S3. You could do something yes. like that, right? Yes, okay. exactly. Yeah. Cool. It's providing a lot of value to the end customer at the end of yeah, the day. Yeah, and, and when you create a perspective, is that creating an endpoint or is that just creating a custom search view for an end user and they would still have to be in Hume to use it. So they have to be in Hume to use it. So actually okay. when accept the data itself that you want to visualize, yep. all the rest is stored in uh, in Postgres. It's part of the application. Yeah, I mean that's the thing though. I mean, you know, Neo has been making a lot of effort into visualizing um but I do think that visuals like like even this ETL that you're presenting is so valuable when trying to get people outside of just the engineering team to yes. use graph data. Exactly. And and I love, even when you were running it, you could actually see it ticking and see like what the output was. Um, that was really cool. And you could go in and actually do some um, general quality checks as it was running, which yes. that's, that's really, really cool. So you can see that the last workflow actually populated articles mentioning organizations right so here you can really see the combination three different data sets right so we had one data set that were representing investor invested into organization then we have another data set that is just representing organization acquiring mm -hmm. other organizations and then we have a third but it's not really a data set but it's, let's say a data source right so which are the, the rss feeds that actually are producing so the articles, but also like the entity extraction. So mm, all the persons, locations, nice. Nice. and the keywords extracted from the article. So you can you can see that by with very simple techniques, you can actually make sense of three different data sets that are connected. We took three data sets, right? So now let's look at like a something unknown that we are able to answer today so if i look at this right so this is in preview mode mm -hmm. so this is something that is found in the data actually so if i have an investor like sequoia capital right mm -hmm. i can actually ask the question okay who are the other investors right investing mm -hmm. in the same market in the mm -hmm. same market. So how do we describe the same market? Well, we find like super relevant keywords from the extracted mm -hmm. text about the article speaking about the companies they have investment in, right? Mm -hmm. So like low earth orbit, there is a very, it is kind of super relevant because this is a like very non-frequent keyword that will be found mm -hmm. in the text. Mm -hmm. And, and thus the relevance is very high. So we can see that this investor actually is investing in the same market as this this investor and how actually this was formed right is by actually uh being able to combine natural language processing so mm -hmm. machine learning techniques mm -hmm. with storing data as a as graph as a network and we are able to find those patterns super easily right and so, so because yeah. the machine learning is built into this um i i recently heard a great quote where um 
graph is not necessarily showing you the answer. It's telling you a very highly probable answer. So where is, um, are there scores um, somewhere in what you just showed so that you mm -hmm. can see what the level of, level of confidence is? Yes, yeah. so if I would take uh, describes here. So let me take an article. And if I would expand the keywords that describe this article, mm -hmm. oh, sorry, non wanted feature displaying. Um, so we can actually see that there is a relevance. So this is actually from zero to one. Uh, so we can see that this keyword is yeah. super high in terms yeah. of relevance. Yeah. Like That's if I would cool. take Hotel delivery 32, tech will be low because it's very common. Right? So and when you're yeah. um, getting those insights that are being generated, do you have to, where do you pre-populate what questions you're trying to, to ask? And can you calibrate, you only want an answer that has, you know, higher than 0.9 or something mm -hmm. like that in the confidence? Very good question. Actually, so this is a good thing with graph visualization. It is, it's nice, but it comes with a lot of problem, is that generally you end up with, okay, I can expand, and then I can expand, for example, uh, and then what, okay? So so actually we offer the user the ability to com customize completely, like what you can find as pre-canned, mm -hmm. pre-canned pre action here, and pre-canned pre action, sorry. Uh, on the keywords themselves, right? So if I oh, would- Oh, nice, like you can do shortest yeah. path right out of the box. I can Did do I everything. I, I can use even like graph data science from the F4J, right, to compute, compute uh, communities of keywords. I can um, find paths, like super long path. So we also have like different types of returns. Okay, of cool. Re so, so yeah. So if I could reiterate, so you have some that are pre-canned that are just very common requests that people ask of graph data. And no, then you no, also no. Have the ability yeah. no. So, so we, we don't provide those pre-canned. Of course, I mean, we can help you build those right, generally. So it depends okay. really on the, on the end user. So if the end user is a very non-proficient with Cypher itself, then we would help the people simply. I create a new action, right? And I say, okay, demo YouTube and demo YouTube, and I say that it will only work on investor, right? And here, I will just do uh, match N. So I have the ID of the node, where ID N, okay. And I will return all the network, all the neighborhoods. It's really just a, a, a demo, right? So, mm -hmm. and P. Return P, okay? And I have to say, okay, I will pass the node selected, okay? Now, if I go mm -hmm. here, okay, and I do Sequoia, uh, Sequoia Capital, so I have to find an investor, right? Which is here, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, I have Demo YouTube. Oh, nice. So it would be up to the data scientists to mm -hmm. basically pre-create the queries, which makes sense because they understand the data the best and they understand kind of where everything goes. And then those queries could be sitting here for um, analyst teams that are commonly exactly. you know, cycling through those. And it's not because the analysts don't necessarily know Cypher. It's just, do they really need to do Cypher queries over and over again? Or can they just have them here. So yeah. that's that's really nice. Here, for example, actually, let me show you the difference, right? So we have this here, and we have mm -hmm. now here a lot of different, a lot oh, like the amount okay. of data so is, what are you doing there? is different. So actually, here we leverage the so what like Neo4j has a graph data science library, so we just use the community detection algorithm, so we can actually group, like have a community mm -hmm. ID for keywords. So that means that we can actually group them visually, oh. right? So, nice. so yeah, and and I will show something that is a combination of a lot of features we have actually. So the grouping, the actions that you see here, etc. So I will give us a sample is, 
Okay, so I will remove this, this grouping particularly, and I will do review groups, right? So here is completely different. The great before right? and after picture. <laughs> yeah. So is that actually I have keywords, so here a bit too much, but Whoa. let's see. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here I just use the keyboard shortcuts to remove, to just take some part of the graph and remove the rest. But mm -hmm. so you can see here. So it's really hypothetical. Actually, it was a fun, a fun demo to do. Mm -hmm. So I want, I want to review what is a keyword and what is not a keyword, right? Mm -hmm. So because of course, when you do machine learning, there is sometimes noise, and you you probably mm -hmm. cannot do nothing about it. So for example, this is very common in natural language. <laughs> Uh, it yeah. is not a keyword. So what I can do is I have an action to say, okay, review negative. So it will remove it, right? So it will not be a keyword anymore in my graph. Funding around, it is a keyword, right? It is something super interesting for me. So I will mark it positive. And now the cool thing is, let me group single node as well. So here I have now review true. Look, so those are keywords I have validated. Those oh, are keywords. I like this. And, and now look at the thing. So for example, here I can actions review positive up and it will move to the other group. Right. I love this. This is almost like creating um like a human kind of review to, yes. to data quality. That's really slick. I like that. So let me show you one of the like the latest feature here, what what we were interested in. So we were interested to start from investor, going to organizations, mentions, articles, then author, right? So that we can actually just draw a relationship here Ooh. in the schema, yeah, right? And say related author, okay? Mm -hmm. And then how actually, how, what is this describing? It's just say, okay, to find related author, Right, you actually have to. The, so this is the start and the end. Mm -hmm. You actually have to traverse one, two, three, three yeah. relationships. Create. Okay. So now let's go to back to our visualization. Not this one. It was this one. Right, and let's take Sequoia Capital again. The investor. Now, if we right click. Oh, we have a new relationship here, related author. So this doesn't exist in the graph, right? In mm -hmm. the database, in the database itself, it only exists in the schema. Mm -hmm. And now, all right, I can go directly from Sequoia Capital okay. without like having all this noise information into. That's cool. Into, so, so we, gen we generate the query, yeah. right? Yes. So this means that you can create also different virtual relationships for different types of users as well. Mm -hmm. And now mm -hmm. again, so again, the perspective. So here, if I right click, I have reveal. So mm -hmm. not only you can just shortcut, but you can also show the underlying read relationships. Oh, right? that's nice. I like that too. I mean, because I think that that's something that a lot of people don't actually do they kind of just throw it into the black yes. box or behind the scenes mm. where it's like okay now you can you can have a different view on your graph data great but you can ex having actually miss explain that yeah because yeah, you, you don't can, know where it came from mm -hmm. yes you can explain and moreover so and this is also sometimes with security is that if i would remove the visibility to the end user to that class Mm -hmm. Well, I can still expand the virtual relationship, but I cannot see the, oh, I cannot reveal it. Oh, I gotcha. So you can still get the insights without a security yeah. breach. That's, yeah. that's slick. I like that a lot.